Hey everybody, welcome! Uh, we want to welcome you and thank you for joining the online gathering of the Pathways Church community. My name is Nick and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever timeline you are in today. Uh, it's been beautiful here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, officially this week we switched into the new season of summer and it's been gorgeous here and I hope that wherever you are uh, that it's been just delightful and beautiful as well and that you are enjoying the new season. Uh, we want to welcome you to this online gathering and if this is your first time uh, connecting with this online experience or with the Pathways Church in general, uh, we'd like to introduce ourselves a little bit. I just introduced myself. I'm Nick. I'm one of the pastors of the Pathways Church community. Uh, but we'd like to introduce what kind of group we are and if this is your first time uh, encountering us, uh, you can find out more information about us by going to the old internet. It's really catching on. I think it might stick around for a while. You can go to our website at findpathways.com and you can read up a little bit about us. In the bottom corner of the screen here, we do have listed our core values. And uh, if you want to know a little bit more about those on our website, we actually give a few more words surrounding those words. Uh, to help you understand a little bit by what we mean by them. And uh, just going online and reading some of the things, the, the ways that we use words to describe ourselves might give you a sense of what kind of community uh, that we are. But of course, when we meet somebody for the first time, we usually like to introduce ourselves with just kind of a thumbnail sketch of who we are. We usually do that with just a couple words, uh, the words cautious and curious. Uh, we are a group that is sort of cautious. Many of us grew up in religious environments, mostly Christian environments, in this country, and we have seen religion used in ways that is helpful, beneficial, uh, that is useful, and uh, undeniably religion has done some things that are very, very good. Uh, but many of us have also seen religion do some things that are harmful, hurtful, abusive, and uh, we have seen that uh, sometimes organized religion gets off the rails and causes harm. And so many of us, because we've seen a lot of that, find ourselves a little skeptical or cautious about organized religion. And you say, well, that's weird because I thought this was a church, which is sort of by definition religion that's been organized. <laughs> And that is true. That is sort of the tension we live in. We have uh, formed a community here that is organized to some small degree or another, but also live in the tension of being a little skeptical of organized religion because we know how it can go off the rails very quickly. Now, the other word that we use to describe ourselves is the word curious. And we use that word because we're just a group that likes to ask a lot of questions. Uh, there's things that we run into all the time that we don't know, and we think it's uh, perfectly acceptable, in fact, actually healthy to ask questions about those things, uh, that we don't have all the answers. It's okay to admit that and uh, to ask a lot of questions. But it's not just things that we don't know about that we like to ask questions. We also like to ask questions about things that we think we do know, or beliefs or ways of thinking that have been handed down to us that maybe we've just kind of accepted for a long time, uh, but we like to re-examine some of those things and kind of ask some of those questions about whether or not those ways of thinking or believing are actually working or in fact ever did. So we're a group that likes to ask those questions as well. So if either of those two words kind of resonates with you, either cautious or curious, this might be a very good group for you. Now, just in uh, terms of what we're gonna be doing here over the next few moments, this is sort of an online church for a lot of people, and so we kind of do everything you might expect to see in an in-person gathering. Uh, first of all, our worship leader, Billy, who leads us in our in-person gatherings, is going to come on the screen and lead a couple songs here in the online space as well. Uh, so he's going to sing a couple songs, and then in between those is sandwiched a reflection video. And uh, most of our videos over the last few weeks and the coming weeks are revolving around psalms. So we're going to get a little psalms reading here today because we're doing a series on the collection of poems and songs and liturgies uh, that we commonly call the Book of Psalms. And so uh, there'll be one of those sandwiched between two songs. And then after that is done, I'll come back on the screen. I'm going to share a message uh, about the maybe the most famous psalm of all time. And it definitely is, I'd say. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Uh, we're going to look at that one today. And then at the end of our time here, uh, we'll wrap us up um, by taking us to communion. And in our in-person gatherings, we take communion every week. And if you'd like to participate in that at home, you'll just need to gather together a couple items. Um, you'll need something to represent the bread and something to represent the cup. So uh, for the bread, you can go find maybe uh, a small cracker or just a chunk of bread and pull that out of the cupboard somewhere. And then for the cup, if you want to go find just a little bit of juice or maybe some wine left over from last night, 
and get those things on hand for when we take communion, you can participate with us. And then finally, we'll wrap up with some announcements about some things that are happening this summer that you'll probably want to know about. Okay, that's pretty much uh, a thumbnail sketch of where we're going today. Uh, so before we jump into Psalm 23, the, the most famous psalm of all time, uh, let's get into the music first. And so Billy, why don't you take it away?
with. This is uh, Psalm 115. Not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Why should the nation say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens and he does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see, they have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell, they have hands but do not feel, feet but do not walk, they can't make a sound in their throat. Those who make them are like them, so are all who trust in them. O Israel, trust in the Lord, he is their help and shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord, he is their help and shield. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord, he is their help and shield. The Lord has been mindful of us, he will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both small and great. May the Lord give you increase both you and your children, may you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth. The heavens are the Lord's heavens, but the earth he has given to human beings. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor do any that go out into silence. But we will bless the Lord from this time and forevermore. Praise the Lord.
The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all of the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Hey, that's great. Psalm 23 there, the most famous psalm of all time being read to us. And I'm sure uh, that is a psalm that you are familiar with. It's pretty hard to uh, avoid it. Now, uh, I wanted to, uh, before we get into the psalm today, uh, talk to you a little bit about my fitness routine. All right. Uh, I uh, have been running quite a bit over the last decade or so. I uh, run about six miles a day, six days a week, at least when I'm not getting injured, which as I'm getting older feels to happen more and more often. There's usually some sort of lingering injury that I am nursing. But I log a lot of miles each week, and uh, but I kind of have a pattern to things. I tend to run the same route all the time. I've got a little route that I know takes me like five to six miles, and I run it, you know, about six times a week and I run past the same houses, uh, the same trees, on the same roads, day after day after day. I run the same route all the time and I know some people are like, I hate that. I got to you know, mix things up a little bit. I don't. I like it. It's just familiar. I run the exact same route all the time and I like it because once you run the same route over and over and over again, uh, you kind of know what to expect, you know, you don't even have to think about it. You know, you turn up here, you turn left there, you go over here and you turn right. You know, you're going up at this part, you're going down at the other part. You know, it's a little sunnier over here, but you run through this section and it's shady and cool. I mean, you just know everything to expect. I don't have to think about it. I just set out on a run. I usually have my AirPods in and I'm listening to some sort of sports radio deal or something as I run. And I'm thinking about that. I don't even think about where I'm running because I've run it so many times. And once you've run a route 500 to 1,000 times over and over again, it just becomes so familiar that you just do it completely on autopilot. And that's probably the reason why I am so unobservant out on my runs. Now, my wife, Tanya, she often runs the same route. And so sometimes she'll come home and she will notice uh, some sort of difference in uh, the journey and she will mention it to me. Like for instance, she'll say, hey Nick, did you uh, notice that house on our run, you know, on the route there? Did you notice that house on fire? And I'll say, what house? And she'll be like, what house? The house on fire that you must have just run past. And I'm completely unobservant. Like, it can't, okay, it's not usually a house on fire, but it's something like a tree cut down or something. It's something that should be really obvious that I should notice. And I don't notice it because I'm out there running the same trail over and over and over again on the same path. And it's so familiar to me, I don't expect to see anything new. And that's actually a big problem with familiarity is the blindness that it can cause. In fact, some people call it familiarity blindness. That That is the problem with being so familiar with something that it makes you new, uh, immune rather, to new observation. It sort of blinds you. And that is sort of what we're going to talk about here today. Uh, we are going to be looking at the most familiar psalm of all time today. Something that you are probably very familiar with. You could say, well, maybe Psalm 139. That might be a close second. But no psalm is known more than our psalm for today, Psalm 23.
3. The 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd psalm. I mean, everybody knows this psalm to some degree or another. You don't have to go to church a lot. You don't have to read your Bible a lot to be aware of Psalm 23. It's a psalm that is very familiar to people in our culture. It's a psalm of trust and comfort. It's a psalm that's good for times of struggle and pain and confusion. In fact, recently there was a survey on places in the Bible you would turn to for comfort in difficult times. And far and away, the number one place that people would turn during times uh, that were difficult, where they were looking for comfort, was the 23rd Psalm. It was the top of the list far and away. Now, Psalm 23 has also been the inspiration for many different Artists, we recently watched that Bono shared uh, that you too would read psalms backstage before their concerts and then be inspired by them and go out and play their music. In fact, even some of their songs are patterned after individual psalms in the Bible text. But other major composers classically like Bach, Bernstein, Schubert have set the words of Psalm 23 to music. And even other modern musicians have used the words of this psalm. Pink Floyd's song, Sheep, uh, makes an allusion to the psalm. Uh, the Grateful Dead's Alabama Getaway, Coolio's Gangster Paradise, and Megadeth's Shadow of Death, they have all used words from the psalms in their own way. I mean, these are people from wildly different genres that are incorporating the, the words, at least, and the ideas of Psalm 23 into their art. Now, it's not just movies that the psalms has uh, somehow inspired. It's also things like movies. In fact, the Titanic was in the news this week, obviously. Uh, but uh, in the movie Titanic, uh, the Psalm 23 was read by a priest as the Titanic sinks below the waves. And even President George W. Bush, Bush, Bush <laughs> once quoted Psalm 23 when he was addressing the nation from the Oval Office on the evening of the 9-11 attacks. I mean, this is a psalm that gets a lot of airtime in culture. We all know this psalm. It's the most familiar psalm that there is. So, before we talk about it today, I thought it would be fun to read it together first but to read it in the King James Version, or in this case, it'll be the New King James Version. Because weirdly, that's the version that we all know. I mean, that's the version in King James language that I've read on every cross stitch and every precious moments figurine ever, right? It's always the King James Version. And when you're thinking in your mind of Psalm 23, you're probably saying the words in King James Version English. So, I mean, it would just be a shame not to read it in the KJV. So let's read it together today in the King James Version, slightly modified by the new King James Version. Psalm 23, it only has six verses. Let's read it together. In fact, you can read it along with me and see if you can even close your eyes at points and say it along with me because it's so ingrained in your brain, okay? Verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. All right, Psalm 23, you know it, right? I mean, easy to repeat and say along with me. We've heard those words over and over and over again. No psalm is more familiar, and you probably know it in the King James Version like that, the shalls and everything. I don't say shall at any other time of life, uh, but when I'm thinking of Psalm 23, I do. And we can just recall these words very easily, and that's wonderful. It's great that we can recall it to our mind easily because that is then something that we can kind of file back there for when we are going through a period of struggle and need somewhere to turn for comfort. It's fantastic that we are familiar with this really, really good psalm. But that familiarity can also have a bit of a downside. 
In fact, we might be so familiar with some of some things like this psalm that we end up missing some greater detail to it because we already assume that we know what this whole thing is about. And so today, what I'd like us to do is try to approach this psalm with fresh eyes, to try to pretend that we've never heard it before, and this is our first time hearing this song in our playlist, okay? So I need you to try to forget that you've ever read this psalm, and we're going to try to read it today with fresh eyes. And what I'm hoping is as we do this today, that I might be able to point out a few things that you did not know about this psalm. And then my hope in this is that as you read it, it might make your reading of it more useful and meaningful. It's not going to take away any of the ways that you may have already been reading it and using it, but what I hope is it adds to your reading of this psalm so that it becomes more meaningful. So let's point out a couple things in reading it with fresh eyes that perhaps you had never seen in this psalm before. And the first thing is this. The psalm has two parts. And that's one of the things that's pretty easy to miss in the familiarity with this particular psalm is its structure. The structure of this song or of this poem, it has two parts. Now we often just kind of read it as all one thing, but there's actually two distinct parts to it. There's actually two big metaphors. And it starts with one and it moves to the other. Now, the first big metaphor is obviously the metaphor of the shepherd and the sheep. But the second metaphor that we often forget about and don't think of maybe as a separate metaphor is that of a banquet or a feast. Now, we usually just think of the shepherd idea, but the second part of the psalm really emphasizes this idea of a banquet or a very luxurious meal in verses 5 and 6. Now, the shepherd part highlights God leading the psalmist through difficult, dangerous, and deflating times. But the banquet highlights the blessing, the promise, the wholeness of making it to the other end of this struggle. And we're going to talk why about why that's important here in a moment. But it's good here to at least start and see that there are two distinct parts to this psalm. The shepherd part and the banquet feast part. And let's take a moment then and look at that first part of the metaphor and we might see something else. And here's that the next part I hope we see in approaching this with fresh eyes. That this idea of a shepherd is a little bit more than perhaps what we have always thought of it. That the shepherd imagery is actually a political image or a political term. Now, when we read Psalm 23, we expect to see the shepherd. It's very familiar, right? I mean, it's the thing that we think about. In fact, all the paintings or whatever uh, with Psalm 23 show the shepherd, and rightly so. It's a huge part of this particular psalm. And we often read this idea as sort of a romanticized idea of a shepherd, right? Taking care of his sheep, you know, lovingly lifting it. It's a simple job, but it requires care. And the shepherd guides the sheep and protects them and makes sure they know where to find easy drinking water. And all of that is true. The shepherd was a very familiar part of ancient culture. But this picture in Psalm 23 is more than just a picture of an agrarian animal herder. And when we only think of this picture, which is obviously very familiar to us because of this psalm, it hides a more nuanced picture that is uh, part of this uh, image of a shepherd. There's more to it than just a sheep herder. Because for the ancient people, reading a term like shepherd would evoke deeper images than just a nice shepherd holding a sheep. Being a shepherd was not just an occupation, but shepherd was actually a metaphor. And it was a political metaphor. A metaphor for the king or the ruler. To be a shepherd was to be a political ruler, most notably associated with the king. And so when you have a psalm that leads out with this imagery of the shepherd, it's really hard not to, as an ancient person, 
also have the baggage not just of an occupation of taking care of sheep, but also noticing and thinking of the responsibility of a king. Now, this is not just in Israel, by the way. This was all over the ancient Near East. A man named uh, King Hammurabi in Hammurabi's Code uh, from somewhere around 1780 BCE. Uh, his quote here is, I, this is the king, I am the shepherd who brings well-being and abundant prosperity. My rule is just, so that the strong might not oppress the weak, and that even the orphan and the widow might be treated with justice. You see, here is the king here, uh, King Hammurabi, saying it was the king or the ruler's job to make sure that the country was just or fair, to protect the innocent and the vulnerable. See, kings were often given this idea of, as a shepherd, this imagery applied to them because they were the safeguard, the one overseeing the affairs of daily life and thus in charge of making sure that justice was carried out and that life was overall good. And so the shepherd became the metaphor for ruling in a just way. Now, Israel also used this metaphor for royalty. And of course, it helps that Israel's first major leaders were sort of shepherds to begin with. Uh, Moses, he was a shepherd. Uh, king David, maybe you know the greatest king that Israel ever has. Uh, king David started out as a shepherd. And then this idea of shepherd also from the ancient Near East became a metaphor for the leader of the people. And the best example of this in the text, in the Bible text, is in Ezekiel. In Ezekiel, uh, this preacher, this prophet, Ezekiel, is delivering a scathing sermon or speech against the kings of Israel who had failed in their job as shepherds, failed to protect the innocent and the vulnerable. They were allowing corruption and greed and income favoritism to rule the land. And we notice in Ezekiel 34 that the prophet Ezekiel comes at them very strong for not living up to the calling of being a shepherd. Notice this here, Ezekiel 34 verse 1, the word of the Lord came to me, that's Ezekiel, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to you, shepherds of Israel, not, who, not only, who only take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You see, Ezekiel is saying uh, the shepherds, the kings, haven't been doing their job. He says, woe to you, shepherds of Israel. Israel. And the shepherds here are not like the people taking care of sheep out in the fields. He's talking to the rulers, to the kings who have not been shepherding as a good ruler should. They're supposed to be guiding in the ways of justice. They're supposed to be protecting the vulnerable, the poor, and the innocent. But they aren't doing that. They're betraying their calling. They're violating their position. And this is an excellent example of the political overtones of this term. But it was not just a term used of a human king. It also conjured up the ultimate picture of shepherding, which was by God himself. And so Ezekiel, in Ezekiel, God says, Since you won't be the shepherd as a king that you're supposed to be, I will. And so in Ezekiel 34, dropping down to verse 11, it says, For this is what the sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so I will look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they are scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. This is a picture over and over of God as and his people. God as the shepherd. God as the shepherd, the people as sheep. God trying to guide them in the ways of justice and peace. And the people being stubborn, or the Bible says stiff-necked and resisting at every chance. You see, because shepherding in this way for God is not romantic. It's hard. It's thankless. It involves some hard tension, both for the shepherd and for the sheep. And all of this would have been on the minds of the people reading this psalm. Of course, a shepherd in the field taking care of his sheep like any shepherd would. But more than that, also the responsibility of the king, and then also the struggle with God in their history. The struggle that the people have had as God has tried to shape them and guide them, and they have oftentimes wandered away. All of this, as they read the phrase, the Lord is my shepherd, would be floating around in their mind. It's actually a really loaded phrase that's much more complex 
than we often consider. So let's look at the second part of this text here, the second metaphor. And with fresh eyes, we look at this strange picture of a banquet or a feast and discover that the banquet is actually a promised land image. Now the second part of the psalm relies on a new picture, uh, not of a shepherd, but then switches us in verse 5 to the picture of a, of a large, luxurious meal where every need is met. And we see this here in Psalm 23 verse 5, you prepare a table, a feast, a banquet before me in the presence of my enemies. My anoint, you anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Everything I need you have provided. I've got food, I've got drink, and what's more, everything is luxurious. You're even anointing my head with oil. And this here is a picture of an incredible luxurious feast. And many have noticed that feasts and banquets represent the place of blessing in the promised land for Israel. This is a poetic picture of the safety and the promise of the land of Israel, a place described as the land of milk and honey. No longer on the run from Egypt or out wandering around in the desert eating just boring manna flakes, right? Now we're eating, we're in our land, we're eating a feast, living the good life, we're hashtag blessed. In fact, this psalm has often been read as a poetic description when you put the two parts together, the shepherd guiding through the valley of the shadow of death and all of the danger there, and then into the promised land where there is a feast. This psalm has often been read as a poetic description of, well, the Exodus for this very reason. The people walked through the valley of the shadow of death, led by God, fed, given water, and arrived at a place of feasting among the enemies that they had to displace in the promised land and ultimately building the house of the Lord. In fact, even in verse 6, the phrasing, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life is actually uh, ringing with promised land imagery because Moses told Israel before they went into the promised land that they had a choice to make, to do good and be blessed or to do wrong and find curses. And it appears here in Psalm 23 that the people have only found blessings, surely goodness and faithful chesed love. They have made their choice a promised land. Now, knowing all this, what the banquet represents, it might be interesting to as it leads us to another thought and that is that psalm 23 may not be written by david right after exodus at some point during his kingship but this psalm actually might be exilic or post-exilic now what does that mean well it means that it might actually have been written not just after exodus from egypt by david but during something that we often call the second exodus, the new exodus, which is the exile of the people from Babylon and their return to the promised land to rebuild the temple. Now, Psalm 23 uh, is a Le David psalm. And we talked about this the last two weeks. Le David uh, is the Hebrew phrase attached to the title of some of these psalms. And it just simply, um, le is a preposition of possession, so of, often translated of, and then David like a proper name, David. Uh, so it just literally translated means of David. And that could mean that David wrote it. Um, that is a possible translation. And maybe he is, King David is the one writing this, and he's thinking back to the Exodus event and using the shepherd language that he knows so well. But as we've learned, le David or of David doesn't necessarily mean that David wrote it. It can just as easily mean um, of David. It could mean for David. It might mean about David. It might mean in the manner of David or in the style of David. It could even just mean uh, think about David when you read this. And there's reasons to think that maybe David didn't write this. I mean, first, we already know that the titles uh, on these psalms don't settle who wrote the compositions because they were added much later, as we learned last week. And they also only give us instructions on how to use them for worship. Uh, they weren't intended to be titles that tell us who wrote them, only how to use them during a time of worship. So as you're reading this, think of David. 
but we don't know exactly who wrote it. Uh, another reason why uh, it could be that David didn't write this is because this Exodus imagery or language, well, it's actually a popular trope for the second Exodus or return to Babylon. <laughs> Writers often did this when they were talking about their new Exodus coming out of Babylon, having been conquered uh, by the Babylonians and now being able to return home through the Persian Empire, uh, that they referenced the first Exodus as a way to talk about the experiences that they were having in this new or second Exodus. It was a way of artistic expression. You use the story of the first Exodus to give feelings to the new Exodus. And so this psalm could very well have been written by someone in exile or just after the exile using the language about the old Exodus to give hope to the people who were now experiencing something similar in this new Exodus. And this would have been long, 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 of course, time after David's life, in which case he couldn't have written this. And one of the main reasons people think that perhaps David didn't read this is because of a particular phrase here in the very end of the psalm, in Psalm 23, verse 6, where it says, And I will dwell in the house of of the Lord forever. And that phrase, house of the Lord, is, is pretty loaded, and it often means something very specific, and that, of course, is the temple in Jerusalem. This house of the Lord appears to be a reference to the temple established permanently in the land of Jerusalem. But the only problem is this idea of the temple, well, the temple didn't exist yet, in David's day. It wouldn't be built until after him. And so what many people have speculated, this seems to be another author who is aware of the temple, which perhaps has been destroyed during exile, but is now looking forward to and celebrating the day that it is rebuilt and they can return every day to the temple courts. And in fact, that is my guess as well. That this is probably not written by David. It's probably written by someone in the exile or just after the exile who is looking to use language of the past to explain their present circumstances. So sorry to ruin the psalm for you, uh, but it appears to me that David did not write it. But since we're already ruining this psalm, let's go one step further. And as we read this with fresh eyes, I think it's important for us to notice that the way that the psalm has often been used is probably not exactly what the psalm is talking about. That Psalm 23 is just simply not about life after death. It's not about the afterlife. And that's the bit here that will probably mess us up the most because most of us, our familiarity with this psalm comes from hearing it at funerals, right? You go to a funeral and they almost always read Psalm 23. I remember my grandfather's funeral when I was in seventh grade. Uh, about the only thing I can remember from it is the reading of Psalm 23. And we read this at funerals because it gives comfort to the loved ones, uh, to, to us, I guess, that our loved ones who have passed away will be safely in the house of the Lord forever. Whether they walk through the valley of shadow of death, which we know that they have done because they have passed now, that they will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so it appears to us that this text must be about the afterlife, that you will live with God forever after you die. Now, I don't dispute the fact that you will live with God forever after you die, but it appears that really that's not what this psalm is about. Now, it's important to us to point out here today that most of the wording that we have here, specifically in verse uh, 6, as we have it here, all the days of my life I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And most of the wording in modern English translations these days comes um, and is influenced by the familiarity of this psalm from its King James Version. Uh, we just got done reading it in the King James Version, and a lot of that phrasing you'll notice has been preserved in modern translations too, like the NIV that we often read or any of the other ones, right? Uh, that often you'll still find a lot of the same phrasing, uh, maybe slightly modified, but carrying forward into some of these modern translations. But unfortunately, there are some English word choices in the KJV that misconstrue the meaning of the Hebrew words for us today. And if you notice at verse 6 here on the screen, 
uh, it says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, the Hebrew word for dwell, it really means to return again and again. It's, it would probably be better translated to return. Like every day you come back and you hang out, but then you go home and then you return again. And then you go home the next day, but you return again. It's this idea of return, not dwell. And so you could say, well, it sort of means dwell, but it's a continual action of returning each day. And the reason the King James Version got stuck with the word dwell here is because the Septuagint, which was the Greek translation, used a word that meant dwell. And that's been passed along, even though the Hebrew text actually has a word that reflects the idea of return. Now, this is matched by the Hebrew word often translated forever, which you see at the end, right? I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's how the King James Version translates it. And that word, though, in Hebrew, it doesn't really mean forever in the way that we might think of it in English. In English, we think that kind of means like it's going on forever and ever, even after you die. But what the Hebrew word really means is for as long as I live or for as many days as I have left, okay? Uh, for a long period of time, as many days as I've got left alive, I will keep coming to your temple, oh God. And you can say, well, that's like forever. But it's not forever and like after you die, it's really conditioned upon how many days that you live. So the poem is not really about God taking care of you after you die, as true as that may be. It's actually a poem about your commitment to living in God's presence in the here and now. It's not so much for a funeral as for everyday life. You see, because these Israelites, they didn't even really believe in an afterlife. They believed in a place called Sheol, which we have talked about before, the place of the dead. And they believed that Sheol was a place underground where all things go. Uh, everything that dies goes to Sheol, humans, even animals, and really it had nothing to do with whether or not you were good or bad, righteous or unrighteous, both the good, the bad, the righteous, and the unrighteous. Everybody ended up in Sheol. That's where you went. And so this poem is not about shale. It's about your life today. Now, translators today, they know all this. And you can even see it in the footnotes of the New King James Version. In verse 6, they point out uh, that the word dwell uh, comes from the Septuagint that's noted there by the LXX. That's the Septuagint. And a couple other manuscripts they point out has this idea of this word to dwell. But the MT, the Masoretic text, they point out uh, the Hebrew text, it means return. And then the latter part of verse 6, where it's translated forever, they note that literally it means for length of days or to the end of my days. And so translators already know this. They know that these words mean what I've just described. And so you say, well, then why does it still say forever in the King James Version? And why does it say forever in the NIV? And the reason is tradition. People are so familiar with this historical phrasing of the psalm, like you and I are, like how we just read it in King James Version. We're so familiar with that phrasing. It just kind of, when we think of the 23rd Psalm, it just that those phrases come to our mind that the translators, they just don't want to mess with that and upset people. They don't want to go in and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. They don't want to go in and change it and I will return to the temple of God day after day until I run out of days. They don't want to change that translation because imagine all the hate mail they're going to get. You know, imagine all the evangelical fundamentalists will start sending them emails saying, hey, you're changing the Bible. You see, they know that these English translations aren't quite as accurate as they could be, but they're up against hundreds of years of translation, and they're up against hundreds of years of tradition and people speaking these words in a certain way, and they don't want to stir up the controversy. It's why even in Psalm 23, verse 3, it says, And he restores my soul. Well, the Hebrew word there, nefesh, doesn't mean soul, as in a spirit part of you that lives in you after you die. That's a much more Western idea later. What it really means, the word means life breath or life. 
he restores my life. It's the idea that someone who looks like they have died has come back to life. And so you'd say, well, why don't they reflect that in the translations? Well, it's because people know and love the phrase, he restoreth my soul. It's so well stuck in popular culture that they don't want to push against that. And so they leave it alone. Funny, huh? But you can understand why it would happen. Now, look, the point here is this psalm can be read and used in whatever way you would like. There is absolutely no harm in using this psalm at a funeral and finding comfort in the idea that your loved one is safe with God forever. That is a perfectly fine way uh, to use the sign, uh, use the psalm. But our ideas of afterlife are different than those who wrote most of the Bible. And the point is, our familiarity with something like this psalm sometimes causes us to miss deeper, more nuanced, fuller meanings that are in it. And you may find comfort not just in knowing that this psalm uh, it could be used in a funeral, but you might find comfort in knowing that this psalm is ultimately about living in a way of trusting God in our everyday life today uh, that is something that could be meaningful to you. It's not just about after you die, but you might miss that or you might run right past it without noticing it because you assume you already know what this psalm is about. When you know it's a funeral song, you might miss that it's a song about everyday life. And it's why we need to read some of these songs with ancient eyes. You know, the ancients, they didn't worry too much about the afterlife. <laughs> they just didn't. In part, because their current life was so hard, right? I mean, their current life was difficult. Things happened outside of their control. Things happened that they didn't understand in nature and in their lives. Times were scary. Rulers were unpredictable. There was a lot of injustice. There was poverty. There was death. You know... A lot of the stuff that we experience today and the psalmist words in Psalm 23 give us words of trust in God in the middle of all of these things. Psalm 23, it's an honest appraisal of the dangers and the trials of life, but also a firm trust that God will see you through. And perhaps it's time to read the psalm that way. You may not be at a funeral this week, but it could be that this psalm still needs to make your playlist. Not for a funeral, but for everyday life this week. Perhaps it's time for you to sing Psalm 23. Hey Jesus, we want to come to you today and thank you that we have such an incredible uh, hymnal and it's such an incredible hymnal in the Bible text as we find in Psalms that there is language that helps give us words when we don't have the words ourselves. And oh God, we find great comfort in um, the idea that when we die, we will go, we will be with you forever and that uh, you will take care of us, that we don't need to worry about our afterlife. But uh, God, we're reminded that Psalm 23 is ultimately about living life in a way of trust of you right now. But there are so many things going on around us. We confess this week that um, uh, just in hearing of people losing their lives in a submarine accident and hearing of political unrest and all sorts of things going on around us that we're reminded that life is no picnic, that there is a lot of difficulties and str uh, struggles and pain. And God, we look to you. We want to be honest about the fact that things are difficult in life. We don't want to sweep things under the rug, but we also want to declare that we trust you. And so won't you help us to sing the familiar words of Psalms this week as a reminder that you are not only with us in the afterlife, but that you are here with us right now today, helping us to live lives of faithful trust in you, knowing that we can count on you to get us through. We love you, Jesus, and it's in your name we pray. Amen.
All right, we want to go to communion today. Billy's going to lead us in a little song here as we take communion. And then afterwards, I got a few announcements just to wrap us up. Okay, let's go to communion. song of praise with an outstretched stop
All right, thanks, Billy. Uh, we got a couple announcements here today as we wrap up our time together. First of all, if you want to donate or help uh, financially with Pathways Church Community, uh, you can do that by going to our website at findpathways.com slash donate. And you can set up a one-time gift or a returning gift, uh, recurring gift on there. And uh, we would uh, love if you could help us out in that way. Uh, I know online it's hard being a part of a community uh, and maybe in groups and stuff, kind of missing out a little bit. But one of the ways you can really support this group is by giving financially. And we appreciate so much those of you who are doing that. Uh, coming up here soon, the next couple weeks, we are going to, in our in-person gatherings, be meeting at Zion Lutheran Church in Everett. Uh, we are kind of partnering with them for the next couple of weeks. We're going to do a combined worship service together both of those weeks. And then on the 9th, we are going to uh, be done about 11.15 and kind of finish up with a potluck afterwards how to hang out with the Zion people and just, uh, I don't know, dream about what partnering together could look like. Uh, we don't really have a definite picture in mind of how that would look, but it might be a good time to just sit down and dream what kind of things we could do together. Uh, so we're going to do that here in July, and we would love to have you join us if you're local and would like to do that. Uh, in August, we are going to be going to a Aqua Sox game in Everett, and uh, we're just going to go as a group of families and have fun together. Uh, just a good outing. It's a fun time and a good experience there at the minor league ballpark. And if you want to join us, tickets are $15. We just need to know how many tickets to order. So uh, if you are interested in going, just text the uh, the word tickets and then the number of tickets that you'd be interesting in purchasing, interested in purchasing and uh, just text that to the number 425-379-7284 and uh, we'll be sure to order enough tickets for everybody. Uh, and then if you would like our email newsletter and want to sign up for that, uh, you can do so by just sending us your name and your email address. Uh, you can message us on Facebook or email me. My uh, email is on the screen here. And we would love to make sure that you get all the announcements that way. Okay, that's pretty much it for today. Oh, uh, playlist stuff. We'd love for you to post a playlist, uh, either an Apple Music or a Spotify playlist. Uh, particularly this week, uh, songs that bring you comfort, okay? Uh, it could be anything, you know. Uh, I put together playlists for when I run and things like that. Uh, and it kind of depends on the mood. Uh, but for this particular case this week, maybe create a playlist of songs. They don't have to be like church songs or anything. They can be anything. Uh, songs that bring you comfort. Psalm 23 is known for that. Uh, so if you want to put together a little playlist and post it on our Facebook page, uh, that would be fantastic. Okay. Other than that, we'll meet you here uh, next week in the online space. And uh, if you want to join us in person, we'll be at Zion Lutheran Church in Everett. Okay, hope you have a great week. We'll see you then. Bye.